welcome to Kendall and Cooper Talk Mysteries. I'm Julie Cooper, a thriller writer and half of the duo bringing you our regular podcast series, spotlighting mystery, suspense, and thriller fiction. First, thanks once more to my brother Chris Squires for our theme song, The Man in the Panama Hat. Our theme for this episode is storytelling, but more about that later. First, I'm pleased to introduce our guest, a master storyteller who's been called the father of modern action novels. But I'm going to keep you in suspense for just a moment longer. Back in 1972, he wrote a book with an unusual and iconic hero. That book was First Blood, and the iconic hero, a returned Vietnam veteran with PTSD, was called Rambo. That's right, he wrote the groundbreaking story of one of the best known and most iconic anti-heroes and followed that up with bestseller after bestseller in the mystery and thriller categories. He's been a finalist for the Edgar, Anthony, Thriller, and Arthur Ellis Awards and won the Nero and McCavity Awards, as well as being a three-time recipient of the esteemed Bram Stoker Award from the Horror Writers Association. VoucherCon gave him its Lifetime Achievement Award, among many honors and recognitions. In short, he's a real slacker. He's also a gifted teacher of writing with a PhD in American literature. In his spare time, he's co-founded International Thriller Writers Organization with one of my mentors, Gail Linz. Welcome, David Morell. It's wonderful to have you join us today. Oh, well, thank you for inviting me. Uh, it's our pleasure. Now, Wendy and I talked in one of our recent episodes about originality and how it's difficult to be original in a world where everything is now accessible at the click of a key, or at least it seems that way. Rambo, however, was iconic and a true original, a character that spawned dozens of imitators in books and on screen. I know from looking at your website that you've written a book solely on his origin, but can you summarize for our listeners, where did he come from? Did he just pop into your head? Well, uh, in, in a sense, the um, uh, first thing you have to know is that I was born and raised in Canada. Uh, and I emigrated to the United States in 1966, an eternity ago, uh, to study American literature at Penn State. Uh, and those were the Vietnam uh, years. I was there from 68 to 70. And, um, 1968 was uh, it, the year of riots. Uh, there weren't five riots or 10 riots or 15 or 20. There were literally hundreds of riots. Many were uh, Vietnam related, uh, many were race related. Uh, right. That was the year Martin Luther King Jr. was assassinated and Bobby Kennedy, uh, yes. which, you know, is a sense of what that year was about. And I, as a Canadian, I'd been told that I didn't have a right to voice political opinions in the United States, which is fair enough. Uh, so I kept my mouth shut, but I kept watching and watching, and I thought there was going to be a civil war, uh, that there was so much violence happening. The National Guards, on a, on a routine basis, patrolled American cities after riots. Uh, and uh, I had the idea that maybe the war, it was like the war had come home. And one night I was watching the CBS Evening News with uh, Walter Cronkite. And he uh, uh, led with a story about a firefight in Vietnam and then a, a story about um, a riot in an American city because it seemed like there was one a day. Uh, it's hard to, to exaggerate this. And, and, and what, you know, those moments as writers, you know what I'm talking about where all of a sudden this idea comes to you and the idea that came to me was it's as if the war came home. And uh, I had this idea about a returned Medal of Honor winner who wanted to see what he'd been fighting for. And we have to remember in the late 60s, anybody with facial hair, or uh, males I'm talking about obviously, long hair, facial hair, were automatically considered by authorities to be uh, 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 terrible and the enemy. And uh, it, it was, I, I have a mustache and I grew it in 68. And uh, it was amazing, uh, the reaction of authority figures, just because I had a mustache. So uh, I just got to thinking, what if this uh, mild-mannered, seemingly mild-mannered 
person with the long hair and the beard was actually a, one of the, the uh, most extreme fighters in the world. And what would happen if the police hassled him to the point where he said, you know what, I'm not going to take this anymore. So that was the general idea for the book. And I, again, because I was Canadian, I was determined not to put any politics in it. I'm not even sure that I think Vietnam might be mentioned twice in the novel because uh, I was trying to think about how maybe in the book would read in 10 years or 20 years when the politics had become muted. So, uh, and I think that's one reason the book lasted. Uh, this is its 46th anniversary. And, Amazing. Uh, yeah, 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 no kidding. And I, yeah. I knew I, I wrote, yeah. spent three years uh, writing it, uh, trying to learn how to write. And uh, a brand new edition came out just last year. Wonderful. Oh, wonderful. Well, you've been a major influence on many writers and have been a mentor to one of our favorite past guests, K.J. Howe, another Canadian. Um, I've got to ask, what's been your single most powerful writing inspiration or mentor? I know you mentioned several people on your website, but is there one key person that you can point to? Well, well, there were there were three. I hate to... to make it complicated. I traveled to the United States because I was um, I was in, inspired by a Hemingway scholar. Uh, who ever heard of a professor writing so vividly that um, I, I actually tr left my native country to study with him. Um, and uh, it, while I was there, I met a, my first professional writer, a, a science fiction writer from the Golden Age, whose name was is uh, Philip Klass. Uh, but he had uh, a pen name of, of William Ten, and William Ten was uh, uh, very respected, and and he graciously allowed me one-on-one um, -on -one, uh, teaching, which is one reason why, for people uh, such as K.J. Howe, that I've 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 often sat down for uh, uh, very personal sessions, uh, and then there was one other person named Sterling Siliphant who was really behind it all because he had uh, uh, written most of the scripts for a TV series called Route 66 uh, uh, about two young men in a Corvette convertible traveling across the United States in search of America and in search of themselves and the the, the scripts which were a combination of action and, 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 and thought, so inspired me that I, when I was 17, had written a letter to him uh, saying, I want to be him. And he had graciously sent me letters encouraging me. So you put all three of those together, and they were um, the driving force that uh, kept me going. Wonderful. Kind of the trifecta of inspiration, <laughs> it sounds yeah. like. It's, that's good. I like that. Yeah. And I'm sure you felt blessed to to have you know their attention and and their responses. So that's well, well, wonderful. One, one key to my personality is that uh, my father died in combat, and uh, uh, when I was like six months old, so I never met my father. And my my mother remarried, but it, it, to someone who didn't like children, and uh. there was a lot, of, a lot of fighting in the home. And I slept under my bed many nights out of fear. So um, mm -hmm. the single most um, missing element in my life was the absence of a father and these three mentors male mentors um, more or less made up that difference and there isn't a day that goes by as I'm writing that I don't think about these three uh, you know generous people who were uh, in different ways able to show me um, how I could become a writer right and that's kind of their legacy to you in a way so uh, yeah, God bless them. They're all gone now. But um, uh, in the grief community, there's a saying, to be remembered is to be immortal. So I, I mention them as often as I can. Oh, wonderful. Well, going over to your Victorian mystery series, starting with Murders of Fine Art, the whole series fascinates me because it's one of my favorite time periods. And I've got to say, you've nailed the details, including the social mores and the class distinctions so beautifully. You've built the series around a real-life character, Thomas De Quincey, a, we shall say, unique individual. <laughs> yes, who, indeed. Who scandalized England with his pre-Victorian book, Confessions of an English Opium Eater, in 1821. It was, I guess, arguably the first tell-all expose in nonfiction and shocked readers with his details of drug dependency. 
something that was then regarded as a moral failing, not an illness. Now, I've researched opium production and trafficking for a book set in modern-day Afghanistan, but can you tell us about the historical research that went into this series of books? I, I sort of gather from looking at the website that you kind of went down the rabbit hole in terms of research. <laughs> well, that, it's my nature. I, you know, some people say, write what you know about. Um, I'm the reverse. Write what you want to learn about. Uh, uh, and uh, so for me, uh, when I start a project, I write a letter to myself in which I say, what about this project is worth a year or two or more of my life? And uh, so there has to be something about the theme uh, that uh, will teach me about myself. There has to be something about the way the book is written that I think will help. Uh, add to the idea of how thrillers and mysteries can be written and there has to be something about the research uh, that will make me fuller so when I was I'd always been interested in the Victorian period and had found it difficult to find books about the period of course it's very complicated it's a very long one and it had different stages but to find books about it that would um, that would make sense to me. And um, uh, uh, I, had, I had gotten into this because um, my granddaughter, Natalie, uh, died from a rare bone cancer in, 19, in uh, 2009. And um, our son had died from the same bone cancer many years earlier. So, uh, you know, the family was generally devastated. And mm -hmm. our daughter uh, naturally began seeking out um, things about grief to try to learn about it to try to adjust to it and she had found a book uh, a movie rather called origins um, uh, creation rather uh, about Charles Darwin's nervous breakdown after the death of his favorite daughter and in uh, he had he had all kinds of things go wrong with him because of his breakdown but nobody could figure out what caused it because at that time in the 1850s we didn't know about the subconscious and we didn't know you know how our minds can can affect us uh, uh, so at, at the end of the story is a way of resolving all this a messenger comes on and says you know Charles there are people like Thomas de Quincey who say we can be affected by thoughts and emotions we don't know we have mm -hmm. uh, and the movie stopped at that point as far as I was concerned because uh, that sure sounds like Freud but this is an 1850s movie, and Freud didn't really do his 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 publishing until the turn of the century. Right. So who who the heck is this guy? Uh, and I I couldn't wait for the movie to end to go off and learn about De Quincey, and sure enough, he invented the word subconscious. Uh, and uh, I'll just give you a little little quote. I just love to say this. His theory was that the human mind was composed of chasms and sunless abysses, layer upon layer in which there are secret chambers where alien natures can hide undetected. Uh, and, and that cool? And, and I mean, it's Freud. Uh, it is. And we know, we know Freud read Baudelaire's translation of De Quincey. So there's a strong possibility that all of this got uh, channeled in ways that um, maybe makes Freud less original than he was. But uh, <laughs> who knows, right? Who knows? Because uh, right. I'm, I'm a De Quincey guy. Uh, so I, as I learned more about the, this man, this unique man, who was called the Opium Eater because of the book that you mentioned, in which he invented the modern memoir, um, I, I got to thinking that maybe, um, and because he had also inspired um, uh, uh, Edgar Allan Poe, uh, uh, who had invented the mystery story, and of course, um, uh, 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 I'm stumbling over my words here, Arthur Conan Doyle had invented uh, Sherlock Holmes based upon Edgar Allan Poe. So I thought, you know, you, if you go back far enough, you get to De Quincey. So why not make him the hero, a detective hero, an amateur detective of a series of books set in 1854, 1855 London, um, that um, would kind of predate uh, everything that I was just talking about. And here we have the newly, just brand new, uh, 10 years, more, a little bit more than that, um, uh, invented uh, uh, Detective Bureau of Scotland Yard. And here comes this guy talking about the sunless abysses of the human mind and, you know, how, how, they, would, how they would get along. So um, it, 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 in a way, uh, a grief... It took me down this rabbit hole, and for seven years as I was writing the books, 
uh, every day I thought I was in 1854, 55 London. Amazing. And he's certainly, a, you know, one of the most distinct, um, tormented protagonists I think we've encountered in a long time. But yeah, oh, what great fun he had. He was a he was a, he he was so funny. Um, he he once said to somebody, "Sir, I enjoyed your book so much, I almost finished it." Oh no! Oh, oh. yeah. He's he's definitely one of a kind. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, and another of his quotes is, there is no such thing as forgetting. This, the memories are like the stars in the sky. They disappear in the day, but they come out at night. Oh, I mm. love that. I truly love that. Well, I'm wondering, since he's uh, he was a real-life personality, yes. what what are the challenges for writers who decide to tackle mixing real-life historical personalities like De Quincey with fictional ones as you did in that series of books well i it it's i guess it depends on your attitude uh, we we've all read historical based stories which often feel like costume dramas yes a, and and have uh, uh, all kinds of anachronistic uh, references and people using modern expressions and things like that. And I, you know, I, I just have a limited patience. Uh, and I, my, my goal was that if I was going to do this, that I had to, I had to do so much research that um, I would be scrupulously accurate to the period. And of course, the automatic problem there is how much is enough uh at what point do you do you you know overwhelm the reader with things that aren't aren't necessary and um i have a i often talk to my stories as if they're real as if they're people that I makes me that. feel strangely better david <laughs> well you know i <laughs> i was once on an airplane and there was a woman next to me and she, you know how the people are so rude on airplanes he says well what do you do for a living you know so oh. that these days i say i'm a retired literature professor which is not a lie and right. nobody wants to talk to a retired literature professor. and that shuts so them up right that shuts, that shuts them up yes. but i was stupid and i said oh i'm a novelist and all right here it came and you know what's it like and blah 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 and at one point i i i said well you know the most interesting thing part about it is how sometimes the characters talk to you and say you know i prefer to do this rather than that and she looked at me with widening eyes and said you hear voices <laughs> uh, and to make to make it worse to worse is that she was a behavioral psychologist and oh. uh, she was about to ring the bell to send for help on the airplane because she see. thought i was next to a nutcase so uh, <laughs> but yeah. the truth is, uh, there's a kind of a self-hypnosis uh, quality here, and uh, I often, especially if I'm having trouble, uh, and, and perhaps only writers will understand this, I, I think of the story as a, as a person, as an entity, and I say, what can I do, what am I doing wrong? Help me serve you. How can I serve you? Uh, and often that cleans up a lot of stuff because the, an alternate part of my mind will say, "Well, you dummy, you uh, unpack all this stuff. You're given too many details. You know, tell the story." Right. Uh, so the with with the with the with writing this kind of thing, give I give myself permission in the first draft to overwrite. You know, put in everything you need to know, and then subsequently you can always cut it back. I have a friend who's a film editor, and he always says the, the biggest problem is the director doesn't give given enough footage. Uh, and, you know, he had to film a car, uh, edit a car accident uh, in a movie, uh, but the director had not covered it from enough angles t so they could have a really exciting car crash and he was actually uh, lifting there was a scene earlier in the story where a, a car pulled up at a curb and there was a shot of a hubcap and then a shot of the door opening and and uh, somebody with nice boots getting out of the car so he actually lifted the shot of the hubcap from that scene and put it in the car crash scene uh, uh -huh. so uh, you know i thought all right Lots of footage, lots of footage. So uh, when I'm writing the first draft, I, I, I know it's going to be unwieldy, so I put in a lot of stuff that maybe I won't use and, and get it out of the way. And then for the second draft, for me, that's the fun part where I be can begin assembling and rearranging and, and telling the story using, you know, whatever tools my research gave me. Good advice. 
good advice. Okay. So sometimes more is more rather than less is more. <laughs> yeah, sometimes more is more. And then, of oh. course, there are different, you know, we can categorize writers in a lot of ways. Uh, some writers are putter-inners and some writers are taker-outers. There's a, I'm going to sound like a professor, uh, uh, F. Scott Fitzgerald and the Thomas Wolfe, not to be confused with Tom Wolfe, but Thomas Wolfe of uh, Look Homer and Angel. Yes. Uh, they had a, a, a correspondence and, and they're quite different writers. Wolfe is a putter-inner and Fitzgerald's a taker-outer and they were trying to compare their techniques and you know come to terms with how um, I think the putter inners have it easier because there's a less uh, uh, you know less discipline required so to speak that I don't mean that as a as a as a as a criticism I envy it I, I you know I wish I weren't stringent and compressed but I learned by studying Hemingway uh, and I'd love to be like Thomas Wolfe and be able to you know expand but it's just not my thing and you know I I learned a part of my one of my heroes is James M. Kane and there aren't there is are fewer spare uh, writers than uh, than Kane uh, so uh, in any case uh, uh, I then started the writing and or the reading, and for two years, literally the only books I read, literally the only books I read, were about 1850s London and Thomas De Quincey, uh, and I, I could have taught a course in in the period. And then I made friends with uh, two De Quincey biographers, uh, Robert Morrison and Greville Lindop. I love his name, Greville Lindop. Greville, I, yes. I, I think it's Anglo-Saxon. And then I made friends with a wonderful uh, historian of the of the period, uh, Judith Flanders. Uh, and they, you know, they were good enough to read my, my drafts and tell me, hey, you know, that's a little too modern. Maybe I kept wanting to call the city of London as opposed to metropolitan London, the city of London, uh, the financial district. And oh, they kept going after me. They said, no, it's too American. And they didn't think of it that way. It, it became a chore uh, to figure out how uh, to differentiate that particular part of metropolitan London. Right, right. But the details are, are everything when you're writing historical fiction, certainly. Well, uh, and, 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 and then I developed, I found this technique of a little factoids. The, the, the Victorian novel is more diverse in its form. Uh, and you could mix third person and first person, and you could throw in essays, and you could do whatever you wanted. It was so liberating. So I thought, all right, I'm writing these books set in 1850s London. I'm going to pretend they're imitation Victorian novels, and that'll give me more latitude for viewpoint and more mm -hmm. latitude for inserting information. And sometimes the narrator just came on. I'm going to read a piece uh, later. Sometimes the narrator just came on and gave some factoids, and it, it, it was okay in that context because that's the way Victorian novels were. Right, and it worked, and it worked. Well, I'm going to put you on the spot now, David. Since you've taught writing for many years, can you give us sort of in a nutshell, your top three qualities of compelling fiction, the characteristics that make writing really stand out for you. Uh, I, I would say that uh, and when I when I met conferences and when I, you know, give talks about writing, the, the, the simplest thing uh, to fix uh, and the, the mistake I see most often is that writers of fiction rely almost solely on the sense of sight. Uh, they may think that touch and smell and sound and taste are in their books, but that it's in their head, it's not on the page. Oh, okay. And, and they have almost exclusively emphasized the sense of sight, and to that degree, by definition, you will have a one-dimensional narrative. It will feel flat. Mm -hmm. And again, to sound like a professor, uh, my my doctoral dissertation is on John Barth, uh, a very well-known uh, American novelist uh, from the 70s, 80s, and 90s. He doesn't work to us anymore. Uh, I mean, uh, yeah, he hasn't published in quite a while. And um, uh, he often wrote, uh, I don't write like this, but it's kind of fun. He wrote a short story called Lost in the Fun House about the troubles of writing a story called Lost in the Fun House. And in it, I know, it's it's mind-boggling. Uh, it's not for everyone. Uh, but in it, 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 he he started to describe a character and stopped in the middle of the description and gave a dissertation about how to describe. 
And what he talked about was the method of what he called triangulation, in which a detail of sight would always be anchored with two other sense details. Uh, and I, I've used that religiously. People often reading my stuff say, oh, it's just like being in a movie. But it isn't. That's just their way of describing it. I don't want make people to see my narrative. I want them to feel my narrative. I want them to feel as if they're in the center of it. And whenever, and I, you know, if you look carefully, you have to look carefully because I hide it. I don't want people to know what I'm doing right. while, they're re while they're reading the book. Um, but you'll see that uh, I go to elaborate lengths to emphasize uh, things besides uh, I shouldn't say elaborate. I got to say it a different way. Subtle, subtle uh, ways of emphasizing the other senses, and then to that degree, people feel they're in the book. Great. Well, that's something for me to look at when I go back and edit and review my own writing. So thank you in, for that. In the review, because when you're writing, I mean, you know, you've got the story to tell. But I have a, a checklist when I'm when I'm done and into the second draft and one of them is, hey, are you anchoring it in those other senses? And and in the second draft it's easy to do. Great, great. Now our listeners frequently ask us and want to know what a typical writing day is like for someone with your experience and expertise. Um, and I know some of the other guests that we've had on the on the podcast have specific writing rituals. Can you tell us how you start your day and are there any rituals that you observe to, to get the creative juices flowing? Uh, uh, to a degree, and but first let's let's uh, indicate that you know everybody's different. Um, my one of my mentors, Donald E. Westlake, he he wasn't uh, as as big a mentor as the other three I mentioned, but he was very generous to me and great great crime writer. I also wrote under the name of Richard Stark, and uh, he he and I often talked about writing. And he liked to write at night. He often didn't start work until eleven o'clock at night, and he wrote through until dawn. Uh, so some people are day, and some people are night, and and what have you. So I'm a day person. Uh, I tend to rise early. I like to read a newspaper. I, you know, I, I, I usually, uh, uh, I have something to eat, and I do some social media, just trying to get the fingers going. And um, the ritual for for writing is that I print out always at the end of a day. I print out the new pages, uh, and uh, I put them with a stack of the previous pages and that stack uh, is taken from my office uh, for security reasons against fire and what have you mm -hmm. and is put on a shelf near a door so that in the event of a disaster I know what I would grab first oh, okay. um, and uh, this is not only for security but it is also because re in revising uh, the task is to mix it up and always see from as many different perspectives as we can. So I'm an analog alternate digital person. So in the morning when I reread and revise, I'm reading actual pages. Oh. And I am reading elsewhere from where I write. It is not good to read your stuff in the same place where you write your stuff because you've got to have different perspectives. So I have different places in the house where I try to differ it as I can. It's not always possible, um, but uh, to, to choose other places in my house where I read the previous day's work and make notes on those pages and then go to a, to my desk where my computer is and put those changes in electronically and then write um, electronically. And I so I, I go back and forth this way and it's amazing what you notice um, when you're alternating analog digital. Uh, and also, um, I'm not, uh, I'll, 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 I, I don't want to forget this, uh, uh, the, the trick is at the end of each draft to change your font as well. So if you're using Courier, switch over to Times New Roman for the next draft. And once again, you're going to see everything differently. Uh, so, so I'm doing this uh, during the, you know, I'm going through, I start with the printed pages. I try to do five pages a day. That is a lot if you're writing honestly. 
And if I can get those pages done, I might say, what the hell, I'm going to go do something else. Um, but more often than not, it's a six-hour job anyhow to write those five pages and be honest about them. Um, so I tend to work from maybe 8.30 till 4-ish, uh, something like that. I, I like to break up the day and exercise. Uh, in the summer, it's swimming. Uh, in the winter, it's a treadmill. And uh, I, uh, at the end of the day, uh, also have um, a small alternate hard drive, which I plug in and then I back up what I've, the new work. Uh, and when that is all done, I unplug the hard drive and carry that somewhere else, another place near a door so again in the event of a disaster now this is very important i do not trust the cloud i i do not <laughs> trust the cloud that it can be stolen from and i do not trust the cloud that one day it might crash right uh, and there are people who say oh no no it's impossible right i it, let's just say it's in my nature to be suspicious all right so, so i use so i have a backup printed copy of a book and i have a hard drive backup which as i said i unplug at the end of the day i know somebody that was very proud they used even thumb drives and they used an alternate hard drive and they kept them plugged in all the damn time uh -huh. and then when the lightning strike struck oh boy and they never printed out so i mean you know uh, uh uh hey you know it's your work it's your life but if it were me i'd treat it like gold and, and save it uh physically so uh anyhow that's my ritual and then uh I, because i've i've been right reading all day i tend to watch uh, something on television a movie or something and then i read after that uh, so and also during the day i take a break every hour and stare at the horizon uh to save my eyes so Good isn't idea. that isn't that terribly interesting? Uh, that, that'll no. just everybody goes through everybody's mind now. Uh, but anyhow, that's what I do. I think that's great advice, and you gave me some definite suggestions for things I could be doing differently and perhaps better. Um, now I'm going to be headed back to New York City in July for Thriller Fest and Mastercraft Fest again this year. Yes. Can you describe how this remarkable organization and the related events came to be? I know you're kind of one of the godfathers of ITW, so tell us more. Well, uh, back in, uh, I'm going to say 2007, um, a, a number of us were uh, guests of Barbara Peters at a bookstore in Scottsdale called The Poison Pen. Mm -hmm. And it's known as a mystery bookstore. But when we looked at the roster of people who were giving an all-day special event uh, that um, was being held at the Arizona Biltmore Hotel, uh, uh, Lee Child, uh, Clive Cussler, myself, Gail Linz, uh, 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 Kathy Reichs, uh, Steve Hamilton, and, uh, uh, and I'm missing a few. Um, but uh, we realized that we were essentially more um, thriller writers than we were mystery writers in the sense of whodunits. Uh, and somebody said, hey, it might be cool to have an organization. So the following year in Toronto at BoucherCon, um, Gail and I, for fun, had a, a organized a meeting in which uh, the question was, would you like to have a thriller writers organization? And about 90 people showed up. Uh, and uh, uh, I remember looking away, uh, waving to a friend that came into the room, and the next thing I knew, I, Gail and I had been voted as the co-presidents, which uh, co-founders, co and which uh, I, I'm, I'm, I'm a Myers-Briggs introvert. I like to stay in a room by myself. I am too. Uh, yes. <laughs> and, so. So there raising your hand was very risky. <laughs> well, I, I, yeah, I, I sort of waved, and I guess that meant I was agreeing. So, uh. um, so we, it was hard in the first years, uh, uh, just getting everybody, uh, other people, to know what we were trying to do, and and to get. Uh, 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 th there was a lot of help from. Uh, I mean, Gail and I co-founded, but. I mean, there were a lot of people. David Dunn, an attorney who volunteered his offices, and M.J. Rose, who taught us about publicity, and 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 on and on. I I, I get nervous if I start naming uh, people because there's going to be somebody who says uh, you didn't name me, and I'm sorry if I if I, in in the haste of my explanation, uh, I may have not mentioned anybody. But uh, there were a lot of people who helped, and. Um, 
Uh, uh, one of them, uh, in fact, was um, uh, I'll, I'll get to it. I, uh, if I go on this tangent, we'll be here all day. But in any case, we uh, the, the the year after that, uh, we had our first uh, session at the Arizona Biltmore, where we had the idea had started, and then it moved to uh, New York City, and the first week of July, because that's where agents and authors are, or, or uh, publishers are, and after all, it is a writers' organization, even though we welcome. Um, readers to our events. Um, so over the years, starting with 90 people, and I think Gail would say it was less than that in 2007, uh, we now have several thousand members. I know. I My first trip back to ITW's Thriller Fest was last year, and I had told someone when I came back, I said, I finally feel like I've, I've discovered my tribe, you know, a place where I belong. So, well, you know, at the time there was a big discussion about the difference between the mystery writers of America and thriller writers and, and, you know, how do we define mystery and how do you define thriller? And I've had many, many conversations where, you know, to me, uh, a, a mystery is the solution of a puzzle. Uh, yes. I mean, that's literally what it means. And, uh, 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 and, uh, and, and it's, uh, the, the British crime writers have solved all this by simply using the word crime. <laughs> so it's, you know, it's a big umbrella term that we're all crime writers. And then you get rid of all the, you know, the distinctions that uh, maybe boggle the mind. Sure, sure. And last, your website at davidmorell.net, and that's Morell with two R's and two L's for our listeners, is a terrific resource and is one of the few websites I think for writers that I've seen that actually helps readers by categorizing your books. So I'm wondering what's the next writing project on the horizon for you David? Well I'm, 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 I don't want to speak uh, specifically about it but um, the, uh, this is my 46th year as a published author uh, and it it has been my observation uh, starting in 1972 that careers often go in arcs that and that 20 years uh, is often how long a career lasts if and I'm going to say if because um, you know everything changes but um, if uh, often a writer finds something that works for that writer and that writer repeats it and repeats it and repeats it and and tries to do creative work and develop and all of that but there is a risk after 20 years that maybe readers will say i get it and a risk that the author might say yeah i get it too mm -hmm. uh, you know it's 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 you know it's, it's a challenge to write um you know to try to keep evolving uh so i made a decision early that uh, while all my books would have action and suspense they would often go in directions that weren't predicted so in 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 the in the seventies i was writing outdoor action such as first blood uh, uh, in which rambo was introduced in the eighties i was writing uh... what i hope was a new kind of spy novel uh, the brotherhood of the rose was the first one of those and the idea was to at a time when the british and the american uh, mister no uh, Come on, the British and American espionage novels were separate uh, to try to combine them. Uh, and by that I mean that the British espionage novel tended to have a lot of really accurate spy trade craft and almost no action. If you go and read uh, er early um, uh, uh, um, Tinker Tailor Soldier Spy, for example, by John Le Carre, yes. uh, you know, it's all, the action's all backstage. Uh, it's mostly a lot of uh, pasty people sitting in, in dark rooms. Uh, <laughs> yeah. and mean, meanwhile, in the American version, we'll use Robert Ludlum, there's all kinds of running around. But Bob wasn't always the greatest researcher when it came to spy tradecraft. And uh, sometimes it's kind of um, uh, silly. Uh, so um, the, the idea was to try to combine these two so that the strength of the authentic tradecraft in the British tradition with really strong uh, action in the American tradition and try to bring them together. So I was doing that in the 80s and then I did some other things in the 90s and, and, and so on. And, and this decade, of, at least so far, has been 
you know, my my really strong historical thriller mystery period with the the De Quincey books. I'm I am working on something that's contemporary now, but I have to say, after having been in uh, 1850s London for all those years, it was very difficult for me to come back, uh, and it it took me almost a year before I felt comfortable writing uh, contemporary uh, fiction. Fascinating, kind of a decompression period almost. It was. It wasn't by choice, but you know. And also, I, I, I'm confused. After, you know, the, the Victorians weren't always the nicest people, but they were about manners. They were about civility, um, uh, and and I, uh, alas, uh, for whatever reason, um, and both sides will blame each other. We live in a a low toned culture. Uh, and that, and I thought, who am I writing for? Uh, you know, I, I, I'm in some ways, based upon what I was seeing on the news, I, you know, I, I just felt very uncomfortable. Uh, but uh, as I said, I found something that was able to solve that problem for me. Great. Well, we'll look forward to that when, when it comes out. Um, David, I believe you're going to give our listeners a brief reading selection. What are we going to hear from you today? Well, this this is from Murder is a Fine Art. I mentioned the factoids that I included in the narrative where the narrative would stop and as it were the, the narrator would uh, would would supply a history lesson. And it sounds like it's very daunting, but actually uh, I found that I could do it in a way that was kind of fun. Uh, and this is, you mentioned a little bit earlier, we were talking about confessions of an English opium eater and De Quincey's uh, uh, drug problem. So this, this is a brief section, uh, I'm, I'm editing it as I read it, about um, the primary form of drugs in the um, in, 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 in the 1850s. The color of laudanum is ruby. It is a liquid that consists of 90% alcohol and 10% opium. Its taste is bitter. A Swiss-German alchemist invented it in the 1500s when he discovered that opium dissolved more effectively in alcohol than in water. His version included crushed pearls and gold leaves. In the 1660s, an English physician refined the formula, removed impurities, and prescribed it as a medicine for headaches as well as stomach, bowel, and nervous disorders. By the Victorian era, laudanum was so widely used as a pain reliever that virtually every household owned a bottle. Considering that opium's derivatives include morphine and heroin, Laudanum's reputation as a pain reducer was well-founded. Toothache, gout, diarrhea, tuberculosis, and cancer were only some of the ailments that laudanum manufactures, such as Batley's sedative solution, McMunn's illicit elixir, and Mother Bailey's quieting service syrup claimed to alleviate. <sighs> women, women used it to alleviate menstrual cramps. Colicky babies were given it. The concept of physical addiction was unknown in the 1850s, um, uh, but Thomas de Quincey made no st secret of his dependency. During the 1820s, he became the most notorious author in England because he was brazen enough to document his habit in a scandalous national bestseller, Confessions of an English Opium Eater. In it, de Quincey described an incident in 1804 when he went to a pharmacy to buy a small quantity of laudanum to subdue persistent pains of the head and face, his first experience with the drug. At the time, he was a 19-year-old student at Oxford University, and his facial pains were probably the consequence of the nervous pressure that he felt as a young man without finances amid well-to-do students in the intense university environment. For nine years, he gradually increased the amount and frequency of his intake until by 1813, he was able to control his compulsion only for brief periods. At the height of his dependency, his daily consumption increased from a third of a teaspoon to astonishing 16 ounce decanter. One ounce would be lethal to anyone not accustomed to the opiate. Oh my goodness. 16 ounces a day. Thanks so much for that reading, David. I <laughs> remember that passage and I remember my reaction to it in this really great series that you have. That's a, that was a great passage to read. 
Uh, this is Wendy Kendall. I'm a cozy mystery writer and the other half of Kendall and Cooper. And in many mysteries, and very much so in cozy mysteries, there's a final reveal, or it could be a confession, where the reader discovers the killer's motivations. In Murder as a Fine Art, you very skillfully bring the reader into the killer's mind and point of view along the way in some of the chapters with critical scenes. How and why did you choose to craft your book this way? Well, De Quincey wrote, uh, he didn't only invent the modern memoir, and he also invented the true crime genre, as we understand it, but he also invented a modern form of uh, literary criticism, which he called psychological criticism, in a, in a well-known, um, if you're in academic circles, in a well-known essay called On the Knocking at the Gate in Macbeth. Mm. Uh, and in it, uh, he theorizes, and this is this is uh, just great advice for all mystery thriller uh, authors, uh, crime authors. Um, he theorized that the secret to a powerful narrative in that form wasn't so much uh, uh, the hero as the villain. And and this is what he said in that essay: "In the murderer, worthy to be called an artist." There rages some great storm of passion, jealousy, ambition, vengeance, hatred, which creates a hell within him. And so following De Quincey's lead, I thought, well, if I'm going to write a novel in which he's the hero, I'm going to have to write a villain that I hope he would approve of. So in all three of the books, um, uh, uh, that was the epigraph to Inspector of the Dead, which is about someone who's determined to assassinate Queen Victoria. Uh, and uh, the, the question is why? And, and my goal was to, uh, he, he kills a lot of people in the process. And my, my goal was to make the reader sympathize with him to the degree that at the end of the story um maybe if i was if i had pushed the right buttons the reader might even be tempted to weep for this person so in all three uh, of these novels the third was called ruler of the night um i chose i developed villains uh whom i wanted to be more sympathetic maybe than anybody else in the story. We'd know, we'd say, you know, this is all wrong, but my God, what this person has been through, yeah, I get it. I can see why this person is doing it. And I feel sorry for this person rather than hating this person. So that that was my goal. And, and uh, 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 you know, in a way, uh, it's easy to create a likable hero, but uh, people sometimes maybe don't spend enough time on, on, the, on, the, on the opposite. It certainly comes across when you read the books. That's, I will definitely say that. Also in the book, Murder as a Fine Art, you have some scenes that are described from the journal of Emily De Quincey, who is one yes. of the characters. Yes. She's, she's the devoted daughter of the opium eater, Thomas De Quincey. And the, for me, this was a creative way to sort of move away from a narrator and provide a very personal diary description of other characters and of the action as seen by one of the characters. Why did you choose this method and what dimension did you feel it added about Emily? Well, uh, first, Emily was a real person. Uh, De Quincey had uh, many children, but three of them were daughters. Um, by the time of 1854, 1855, uh, 1855 uh, one daughter had married and moved to Ireland. Another daughter was, uh, was uh, about to marry and move to India, where her husband-to-be was a British officer. And that left Emily De Quincey, who was the youngest and who was 21. Uh, and she was in real life, uh, his, his, you know, he, she took care of him. He was 69 years old at the time of this, of the, of the novels. And it's, 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 here's this guy drinking 16 ounces of laudanum a day. He lived to be 74 years old. I, I mean, it's just amazing to me. And so he's 69 when, when these stories occur and Emily, I, I thought, okay, she's, you know, I, I need him to talk to somebody. She's the logical person. And she'd be, you know, kind of a, of a Watson to, to my version of, of uh, Holmes. But, but there was a more important reason. Um, 
De Quincey is hilarious. He was brilliant. He's probably the only person who wrote under the influence and actually wrote good stuff. Uh, and uh, I mean, this it sounds heresy to say that. I mean, don't try this at home, folks. Uh, but that's the kind of person he was. Um, and but there's a there's that that feeling latently that no matter how entertaining and smart and he invents the word subconscious and the concept and all that, he's a drug addict. Right. So how was how was I going to get around that? And in fact, you know, even today, a lot of people will in in academia in in, uh, in uh, literature of the 1800s won't give De Quincey his due because how good he could he be because he was on drugs. Uh, well, uh, he was the exception. So I, I was, I was working on the book and we had the murders at the start, which recreated a, a very well-known, uh, set of murders in earlier in the century, uh, shocking murders. And so Scotland Yard, the new, newly deformed de detective vision has arrived and, and they've heard about a real life essay that De Quincey wrote called on murder considered as one of the fine arts in which he recreated these murders on the page, uh, the true crime genre invention. And I'm thinking, uh, you know, so here we are, I've got it all set up and on is going to come Thomas De Quincey. And I didn't know how to introduce him, uh, because the, the payout, the, 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 anticipation is such that you know in real life he was four foot eleven he was 69 he was very frail and thin and and i'm thinking what am i going to do and out of nowhere we're talking about these voices out of nowhere a voice said to me oh boy this sounds stupid <laughs> out of nowhere a voice <laughs> said to me tell this section from emily's point of view which i'd not considered doing but as soon as i did i realized how much how much an advantage this was going to give me because i had suddenly this voice this female voice coming to me and she was hilarious i mean <laughs> i she was so funny and she was so irreverent and i thought this my god where's she coming from but i mean she's based on a real person and i thought i get it if i can make the reader like or even love emily through her first person narrative I can make the reader by transference love Thomas De Quincey. So hence the first person journal. And now the trick here is that uh, some schools will say you can't mix viewpoints like that. But in the Victorian period, they did. Bleak House, for example, Dickens' 1853 novel, uh, mixed first person and third person omniscient all the time. And and one of the founders of uh, the thriller movement, uh, Wilkie Collins, his, his works were known as, as sensation novels. De, uh, he loved to mix viewpoints. So I thought, all right, I'm on, if anybody complains, I can say, hey, if Dickens did it, if Wilkie Collins did it, it's good enough for me. <laughs> uh, so I had my defense and off I went with Emily. Uh, and... Uh, it was so liberating. It was as if I was really channeling somebody. And I know how nutty that sounds, but that's what novelists are. Uh, nuts. Uh, so, uh, so we... And it worked. I was very suspicious. It, the first episode, first section, which was very long, uh, came in one burst. I wrote it in an afternoon. I bet I wrote 10, 10 12 pages. And I, I don't often read to my wife uh, because I feel that if you read out loud to somebody, you're cheating because you'll you'll accent it in a way that it sounds better than it is. Mm -hmm. But I wanted to see if she would laugh. Uh, and it was a kind of a, you know, a verbal, you know, uh, uh, way of writing. So I asked my, my wife's indulgence and says, I want to read this to you. And as I'm reading, she was laughing. And I thought, yeah, it's going to work. My, I had to fix it and all that, but it's going to work. And and so I, the, when I was doing these books, I always looked forward to that moment when Emily would insist on re-entering and, and showing the, the, the foulness of their ways to prison wardens, they called them governors, and, and so-called social experts. She was always making fun of them and they didn't know it. And, oh, I had a lot of fun with her. She was just wonderful. She lived... To, 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 she died in 1916. Isn't that amazing? Wow. Uh, she lived all those years, uh, and she never married. There's a big deal in the in the novel about two Scotland Yard detectives courting her, and yep. at one point, an inspector of the dead. Said, she says, "Have you seen my father?" 
do you think I want another responsibility like a husband? <laughs> <laughs> and, and she never did marry. Uh, she said, I saw my, my father's marriage and I thought, no, that isn't for me. Well, as a reader, I, I'll just chime in and say how refreshing it is as you're reading along, because since you know it's her diary, you feel like you really are getting her truthful feelings as she's writing these. So it's, yes. it's very genuine for the character. Absolutely. Unquestionably, the killer in Murder as a Fine Art sees themselves as, a, as an artist at Murder. And for our listeners, if you haven't read this book yet, you'll find it so interesting the ways that this manifests. But I also felt the London detectives of 1854 were also learning a fine art of investigating murder and finding a killer. Can you talk a little about your research of London's detectives of this time period and the challenges to bringing this occupation to life on the pages? Uh, well, well, that was more of the fun. I mean, every day I got to say, you know, I, I don't know about this. I've got to find some books and I've got to read about this. And in Scotland Yard, um, I mean, it, uh, all of this comes from um, a Frenchman uh, in the early 1800s who was a criminal who then, um, uh, whose name, um, uh, oh darn, now I'm losing it, but he had been uh, a criminal and he migrated over to the Paris police and eventually became head of the Paris police and and told them how criminals acted and what clues to look for. And when when Sir Robert Peel was starting um, the uh, in in uh, 1829 was starting the first uh, organized police force in England, um, he went over to Paris and and was taught by uh, uh, this man to, to and and so the we we get uh, as it were the criminal mind uh, starting uh, a British law enforcement and in 1842 when partly because of an attempt to assassinate Queen Victoria uh, the the Scotland Yard detective division was formed once again they went over to Paris to to uh, to talk to this man and. Um, uh, someone's going to uh, call in and say, you dummy, you can't remember his name. But uh, so at the moment, I can't. Okay. Uh, but but um, the uh, so in 1842, um, they were uh, they figured out that if they arrested whoever they arrested, they should have a sheet about him, a, a, a list of his his name, his alias, uh, whether he's right handed, or left handed, how tall, what he weighed, if he had scars. And every criminal went through Scotland Yard. Uh, they had a record of and. Um, uh, this, this, the, the detectives were learning uh, rudiments such as um, how to use plaster plaster casts of footprints. Uh, this was a big deal for them, and I, that's why I thought it would be so funny to have De Quincey talking about the sunless abysses of the human mind, and they don't know what he's talking about because <laughs> they're happy with their plaster casts. So, uh, what I, what I'm doing in, is 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 um, providing some real life details that were used in cases uh, at that time with Scotland Yard uh, to provide, you know, a sense of, of accuracy for what they're doing. And at the same time, um, uh, uh, contrasting them with De Quincey. I, I have in my office, I have about four shelves of uh, Victorian materials and several of them are devoted to uh, early law enforcement um, uh, uh, from the period that there, uh, and, and also histories um, later uh, of what was happening back then. So it was just a lot of fun to, to talk about these um, if if somebody's uh, let me recommend a book called The Confessions of Mr. Witcher W H I C H E R by Kate Summerscale. See, I can remember her name, but I can't remember that Frenchman's name. Um, <laughs> and um, in any case, uh, they, they uh, uh, she has written uh, a, a very important book about the the origins of the uh, murder at the remote country house where there are many uh, different suspects from different strata of life and the local police can't handle it so they send for Scotland Yard and he shows up to solve the crime and this was a real event uh, I can't go into the details but uh, this is a really important book uh, Confessions of uh, Mr. Witcher uh, Kate Summerscale that would uh, uh, um, see I'm not just promoting my own books uh, <laughs> 
<laughs> and and, and uh, I am looking madly through my shelves here trying to find that darn Frenchman's name. Oh, but that, anyhow, don't worry I, about that. But I, that's great to have that book recommendation, too. Uh, yeah, I'm a fan of Kate Summerscale. never met her, but boy, she uh, uh, she's the real deal when it comes to Victorian uh, research. Great. Well, at one point in your story, Thomas de Quincey tells a little, it's almost a parable that has this point, and I'll quote the point. We see things from a perspective that we take for granted, such as the emperor thinking that the driver's seat was preferable because it was high. But what if our perspective is incorrect? What we think is one thing might be something else entirely. And that's the end of the quote. This struck me as a wonderful thought for a mystery reader to keep in mind. That's the reader. So how does this ap advice also apply to authors? Well, uh, first, that story is, is one that De Quincey himself tells in one of his essays. Uh, and he was, um, he was uh, very big about viewpoint, about reality. Um, uh, he, uh, one of the questions that he asks constantly in uh, the, the books uh, uh, that I wrote about him um, it, it is a question that uh, he constantly asked in his essay, which is, is reality an objective uh, entity, or do we create it uh, by virtue of the the thoughts that we have? And in the novel, I, I use this uh, use the example where he says he's telling one of these Scotland Yard detectives. He says, "Yeah, uh, you know, reality. You create your own reality." And he says, "I don't know what you're talking about." And he says, "All right, let me ask you a question. Does the sun rise?" And he says, of course it does. And does the sun set? Of course he does. Well, in fact, the earth turns. The earth, the sun remains constant. Uh, so, in fact, the earth does, the sun does not rise and the sun does not set. And, and, and when you look up at the sky, is it above you? And he says, yes, it is. And he says, well, no, actually, where we are uh, on, the, on the globe uh, in England, we're sort of standing sideways. And the, and the, and the sky is actually... Uh, out from us, not above us. And he starts to use language to show how in our mind they have created a, a vision of the world, which is in fact not at all objectively the case. Uh, so um, in a sense, uh, uh, this can then be applied to viewpoint, uh, in, 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 to uh, especially with first person. I get, I get so much controversy when I talk about first person, but um, uh, it's if you think about it, uh, if somebody told you a story, somebody comes to you and says, oh, this happened to me and blah, blah, blah. Often you will say, you know, I, I wonder if this person's making it up or uh, I wonder if, um, you know, maybe this person isn't under a strain, is, is exaggerating because this couldn't have happened. And yet when we read a novel that's in the first person, we don't ask these questions until recently. Um, I, I used to uh, talk about Henry James and the turn of the screw and the, the ghost story where the first person is such that we don't know if there's are ghosts or whether the narrator is nuts right. uh, and uh, this is this became known uh, in the 1830s in a uh, essay by Edmund Wilson called The Ambiguity of Henry James. It became known as the unreliable first person. And I used to talk, I went to conference after conference and I talked about this and said, you know, it would be, if you're interested in this, it would be a great idea to write a first person novel where you can't trust the first person. And people would get bored. They'd scratch themselves. They'd look at the ceiling. And then along came Gone Girl. <laughs> <laughs> right, where we had two unreliable uh, first-person narrators in what amounted to, it, it's eventually saved at the end, sort of, but uh, it amounted to the breakup of a marriage. And isn't it ever, you know, anybody who's ever talked to the, 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 the partners in a marriage who are splitting to listen to the narrative from one person and the other, it's like a different <laughs> story, right? Yes. Uh, uh, so, uh, and, and I mean, it's just human nature. So that's what uh, Gillian Flynn 
Lynn did in Gone Girl, and now God help us, every other book is an unreliable first person. Uh, and, you know, that ship will sail eventually, and a lot of people are going to have wasted a year of their lives or less <laughs> um, uh, writing an unreliable first person narrative when there is no market for it anymore. But um, it, th this trend at the moment perfectly realizes um, what uh, illustrates, you know, what you were getting at uh, is that, you know, the viewpoint of a character is essential to helping us understand the emotional relevance of the scene. Uh, and uh, I'll go back to Wilkie Collins. He sometimes uses five, six, seven first person narrators in a row and all of them are different. Uh, and yet each of them, it, what he, the, the, the conceit he's using is an attorney putting together a case to solve a mystery. So each of these are witnesses and each of them saw something different. And yet within each account, there's a secret which the lawyer is able to determine to take the, you know, the truth from all of these narratives and solve the mystery. I mean, it, it, it's just brilliant storytelling. Well, I'm going to turn now to your action and spy novels a little bit and just mention you've also done incredible research that shines through in that writing. Our listeners will be excited to hear that you're an honorary lifetime member of the Special Operations Association and the Association of Intelligence Officers. You've trained in firearms, hostage negotiation, assuming identities, executive protection, and defensive offensive driving among numerous other action skills that you describe in your novels. And to research the aerial sequences in The Shimmer, you became a private pilot. Is it really that important for an author to get these things right in their books? Well, uh, I gotta say, I remember the Frenchman's name. It's the <laughs> it's the doke. It's V I D O C Q. Thank God that was gonna. I was gonna. When I went to sleep tonight, I'd be gnashing. My teeth. <laughs> Thank you. Well, all right. So there are some people. Uh, I won't. I'm not gonna mention names. But uh, I was once on a panel at the at the Los Angeles Book Fair, and uh, we, uh, there were five of us uh, uh, mystery thriller crime writers, and and I was talking about research, and someone at the other end of the table, um, uh, who was a bestseller, very well known, uh, you know, interrupted me to, to say, uh, David, I don't know why you're going on about research so much. I just make this shit up. <laughs> oh, and uh, and now I'm a Canadian, uh, so I have manners inbred in me, like from eating Canadian vegetables, whatever. Uh, and uh, so, uh, you know, the response to that, that I was tempted to say yes, and it looks like you make the shit up, ah. uh, but but I didn't, uh, <laughs> uh, because I mean, you know, some readers. I had a house guest once, and I watched this person with a book in the, a lap, a cell phone in his hand, and and fast forwarding through a DVD simultaneously. Mm -hmm. So clearly, for this 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 uh, this person, um, uh, research didn't matter. That this was a, a strictly you know uh, you know give me the one line summary, but. Um, for me, uh, as I said earlier, uh, a lot of what I do is because I want to learn about something. Uh, in the in the 1990s, I, I wrote a, a novel about photography uh, called um, uh, Double Image. Uh, in those days, there was film and there were double exposures, so Double Image seemed a good metaphor for the, the plot. Um, and I spent a long time uh, in photography galleries and I took a course in photography and I, you know, I interviewed photographers and I had a great time. I just learned an awful lot. And, you know, I, I figured that um, since time is our only important commodity, uh, that we should use it as best we can. And if we're just writing books because we we hope to get on the bestseller list, that's not good enough. Um, when we're done with a book, we should feel bigger um, and uh, often the research will do that. Uh, so, uh, you know, and I've had a lot of adventures. As you said, I became a private pilot um, because of uh, the, the airplane stuff in uh, The Shimmer. Um, and, I, you know, I know, all, all, I, I know so many authors 
who's who's uh, i mean if you're writing mysteries and crime and thrillers often you'll get around to talking about firearms and and it it's laughable in many cases i mean it's insulting often uh, what authors will do uh, with firearms because they're too lazy to go out and at least visit a gun shop and get some some information, let alone, God forbid, go to a shooting range. Um, and uh, so I, I've tried when possible uh, to go to experts and uh, that offensive, defensive car stuff you were talking about, it was car fighting. I spent a week at the Bill Scott Raceway in West Virginia learning how to handle cars the way the Secret Service does or the Diplomatic Security Service does and ram barricades and do all the spins and stuff like that. It was great fun. Um, and, you know, I mean, it's it's fun. In addition, I get to put things in, the, in my books that you're not going to see elsewhere because not everybody wants to do the research. And, and I know some people some authors who uh, choose subjects ex especially because they don't have to do the research and and okay it's a it's a it's a way uh, I'm I don't want to knock it because a lot of people making a lot of money not doing research but it's just not for me yeah I like that answer too as both a writer and a reader I know as writers uh, Julie and I both have been doing extensive research and it's like it never ends because one thing just leads to another and the research is enjoyable it's you're learning so much and it feeds your curiosity and as a reader I mean I do want to finish a book feeling like wow I really learned things and it's fascinating and maybe that sparks more curiosity about it. So that I, I love that answer. <laughs> exactly, exactly. For me, one of the best reactions I've ever had in reading novels is when I say, gosh, I didn't know that. Yeah. Uh, and, and, you know, if I can do the same for a reader, and then what happens is the person says, you know, I didn't know that. You've got them. Yes. Uh, you've book them. I mean, they want to, they want to read more, but it's like with, with, with the firearms is to use a, 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 you know, a persistent example. Uh, I know some readers who will not go any farther in a book if they say, discover somebody putting a silencer on a revolver, which is an impossibility. I mean, you can put it on, it's just not going to do any good because uh, a, a revolver can't be silenced in a conventional fashion. Um, and, you know, readers, a certain kind of reader will say, well, this is a lot of hooey. I'm not going to read anymore. That you know, would what, be me. What, yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Exactly. So uh, you know, it's it's uh, we uh, it's a it's a there are different kinds of writers. Some people write in the daytime. Some people write at night. Some people like to do the research. Some people don't. But um, I don't know. It's just not for me. I have to. Uh, I, that is to say, I I need to to be curious. I need to find out. Um, you know, things that I'd like my readers to know about. Well, could you tell us just a little bit about your writing book, The Successful Novelist? Uh, sure. Um, you know, I, I, as I said, I, I was a professor, a uh, full professor, mind you. I'm one of the few full professors I had tenure and you know I was that's there you're in for life when you have that and um you know I at after 16 years I said you know I think I've done this and I resigned uh, people were shocked um uh but so I'd been teaching uh for quite a while but I had taught literature I had not taught writing um and mind you I had you know one of the best teachers with Philip Class and so I um I had been asked to write an essay about dialogue for uh, an anthology that was putting together essays about writing horror fiction. And I, so, you know, I thought, oh, okay, I'll, I'll have some fun. And I'm a big fan of William Goldman, uh, both as a screenwriter, as a novelist, and as an essayist. And Goldman's Adventures in the Screen Trade about the movie business is one of those standard books anybody who wants to write for the movies should know. And he has an amazingly conversational style. So I, I took a look at, and, and I thought I knew how he did it, and I said, I'm going to write it that way, and maybe even try to be funnier than Goldman is. So I, I, I wrote this essay about dialogue, and, and the folks at, at, at the publisher said, this is this is a lot of fun would you write a whole book about writing which i'd never considered um and i but i thought why not you know i, I mean it's not like i don't know what i'm talking about so uh and and i'm classically trained as it were uh, because of my academic background so i can maybe bring 
something a little different to the to the game. Uh, so I wrote the book uh, and I did it like a chapter between this and that, between stories and novels, and and uh, it you know it's it's been very well received. One of the uh, 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 chapters that people seem to relate most to um, is about uh, my suggestion for an alternative to outlines, and I mentioned earlier that I that I um, uh, write letters to myself and these letters often form uh, what amounts to an outline without feeling like an outline in which I ask myself usually it's the, the answer to the question why is this book worth a year of my life and as I get into that question I uh, involving you know theme and technique and research uh, it's amazing where um, the the analysis goes and after about 30 pages of this often I discover that I'm actually writing the book um, so it, it it's uh, it's partly motivational um, because uh, Philip Class had a theory that we all had a dominant emotion and that dominant emotion is why we wrote uh, mm. and but that many times we do not want to know that dominant emotion um, and and hence it would be like a ferret as he described it darting around inside of us as we tried to come to terms with us and he looked at me after a lot of discussion and he said your dominant emotion is fear uh, which is true uh, and uh, that you know so write novels about fear but not about specific forms of fear but ab I, about existential fear interesting uh, and so, and, you know, uh, uh, but people hide this, you know, I mean, if yeah. people, we all meet people uh, whose dominant emotion, is, I mean, I see this a lot, whose dominant emotion is envy. Uh, and I, I see a lot of people whose dominant emotion is hate uh, and, and so on. Uh, but if you said to that person, you know, your dominant emotion is envy, they would, de they would deny it completely. Yeah, and you yeah. never met a person filled with hate who admitted they were a hateful person. Um, but uh, so if you have a writer who wants to write, a uh, uh, Philip Class said you write, you write yourself. That all you have is you. You are one hundred percent unique. So if use whatever is in you as the as the driving force to write books that only you could write, uh, and that's the dominant emotion uh, theory. So. Um, uh, it it uh, can lead to a lot of self-discovery. Um, you know, my understanding of why I was afraid, you know, finally realizing that I used to spend nights under the bed while my mother and stepfather argued. Uh, and, uh, and, you know, and why certain things uh, certain daydreams came to me persistently. Uh, so these are some of the theories that I talk about in the early parts of the writing book. And the, it's called The Successful Novelist, A uh, Lifetime of Lessons About Writing and Publishing. And, and then in later uh, uh, parts of the book, it's about um, nuts and bolts, such as what I said earlier about um, description uh, being least effective when it emphasizes sight. Well, I, I'm going to be rushing out to get that book, so I um, just wanted to hear a little bit more about it. Thanks so much. And Julie, I think now you're going to tell us why we need storytellers. I am, and I've also got to add, I I'm, I'm, have just picked up another of David's books, and it's called Lessons from a Lifetime of Writing. A novelist looks at his craft, and honestly, That's I thought I'd read all the good books on writing, but I had never known about this one, so I'm so enjoying this book right now. That, but, that is the first version of the successful novelist. That, okay. at, at a, that was with uh, uh, Writer's Digest, and when Source Books picked it up, I added a new chapter, and we changed the title. So it's essentially the same book, but the new title is The a Successful Novelist. Ah, oh, very good. Okay. All right. Thanks for clearing that up. Well, I am going to talk about why we need storytellers, perhaps now more than ever. I came across a quote recently that I loved from G.K. Chesterton, where he said, Literature was a luxury, but fiction was a necessity. Some of us, and I'm thinking here of those persnickety New York Times book reviewers, make a big distinction, a big deal about the difference between literature and fiction. Yet both forms of writing, if you can indeed divide them, serve the same purpose, to tell a story to the reader. 
I've just read an essay by Philip Pullman from his wonderful book, Demon Voices, Essays on Storytelling, which made me think more about the so-called divide. Pullman defines it as the difference between the making it up part, storytelling or fiction, and the writing it down part, literature. He defines his talent as, and this is his own words, belonging at the vulgar end of the spectrum, meaning fiction, though having read his work, I disagree, and I know so many other fans do as well. He says the making it up part is where his heart lies. I believe storytellers are more important in our society than ever. People have been telling stories since the first cave paintings were created over 27,000 years ago. And anthropologists tell us storytelling is prevalent in all cultures. Well, there's an evolutionary reason for this. Neuroscientists say our brains are more engaged and more likely to recall important information when we receive it in a narrative. They also say that our brains are much more active when we tell stories. As for watching a PowerPoint presentation, not so much. PowerPoint slides hit the language processing part of our brains, and that's it. Scientists say we decode the words into meaning, but there's no resonance and often little recall. However, when we're told a story or read one, the languaging process parts of our brain activate along with any other areas of the brain that would normally activate as if we're experiencing the story ourselves. Here are a couple of examples. Describe sensory aspects, the smell of smoke, the taste of chocolate, the sharp edge of a knife, and our sensory cortex lights up. Describe motion or action, a car chase, someone fast roping out of a helicopter, and our motor cortex activates. So if we're wired for story, as I mentioned back when I reviewed Lisa Cron's amazing book, Story Genius, why is storytelling such an essential part of being human? Here are a couple of quick thoughts. The best stories are rooted in truth and show the connection between cause and effect. Basically, it's a form of learning. Stories must strike a nerve or have an emotional component. We relate that story to our existing experiences, which builds engagement and empathy, qualities we badly need to survive in any society. And last, stories teach us about overcoming the odds and, more importantly, can teach us about hope. Storytelling is an ancient practice and perhaps the most important tradition that humanity possesses. I'd like to end with something from Stephen King, who said, Stories are found things like fossils in the ground. Stories are relics, part of an undiscovered, pre-existing world. Here's hoping that we never lose the ability to tell stories, and more importantly, to listen to them. Thanks, Julie. You're welcome. That was excellent. Thanks. Thanks. Uh, I just want to talk now in this episode about the reveal. The skill for an author in crafting a story is to provide revelations over the course of the story about characters, about plot, about action, and about setting. Instead of being tempted to immediately indulge in an information dump out all about a character, the art of storytelling is the slow reveal. An author must also not succumb to the temptation to immediately detail all the facts about the time or place. For some information, it's best to wait. As the evil witch in The Wizard of Oz says, all in good time, my pretty. Everything you need, dear reader, will come to you at the perfect moment. Have you ever seen the movie Shakespeare in Love? Shakespeare coaches his actor in how to play the opening scenes of Romeo and Juliet when poor heartsick Romeo is pining over a breakup. Quote, don't sell it all at once. You're talking about a baggage we never even meet. What will be left in your purse when he meets his Juliet, when he meets the love of his life? 
Like the actor, the author needs not to oversell at the beginning with characters, but build them over the course of the story so that the reaction fits the personality when they encounter their great moments. The author must be disciplined in applying the research as well and not be overly eager to detail all of a character's personality traits as soon as the reader meets them. When you meet a person in real life, do you immediately tell them everything about you and expect the same in return? No. You learn about each other over time and through observation and experiences. That's storytelling, too. And how do you learn about each other in real life? Like I said, through observation and shared experiences, but also through what other people may tell you about your new friend. Do you believe everything you hear from others? Maybe you'll learn about your new friend through their work or their creative endeavors. And so a storyteller will also reveal much about characters in the same way. And so, as they say, art imitates life. And in addition to our guests' incredible works, I'd like to give a book recommendation. And that is for a book titled A Study in Scarlet Women by Sherry Thomas. In some ways, the character of Emily De Quincey is responsible for my book recommendation for this episode. Emily is such an intriguing woman and passionate about issues and admirably loyal. In this book, A Study in Scarlet Women, the first of a series, Charlotte Holmes in Victorian London also feels uncomfortable with the demureness expected of women in upper-class London society. When her sister and father are suspected of involvement in a trio of unexpected deaths, Charlotte is desperate to find the true culprit and clear the family name. Under the assumed name Sherlock Holmes, Charlotte attempts to challenge society's expectations and match wits against a mastermind. The author offers some clever changes to the cast of characters from Sir Arthur Conan Doyle's writings and a completely new and fun take on the iconic detective stories. Not a replacement, certainly, but this is a refreshing creative twist. The gender bending is interesting. The author has made a character completely different from the well-known man, but at the heart of the book is a really good tantalizing mystery. This was chosen as an NPR best, bro best book of 2016. Now I'm wondering what David would recommend to our listeners. Ah, uh, uh, you mean books that I'm reading? Sure. Uh, do you, well, have, do uh, you have one that you would recommend? Well, uh, does it have to be a mystery? Uh, well, mm -hmm. go ahead and give us your recommendation. Well, tell, I'll tell you what I'm reading, and in fact is by a mystery author, a uh, well-known one named John Connolly, um, uh, Irish, uh, mystery, uh, very well-known well and much praised. Uh, but I'm currently reading a book by him called He, H-E, which is a fascinating fictional biography of the uh, silent, and I guess he was only not always in the silent screen, uh, uh, Laurel Hardy, or Laurel, um, Stan Laurel of the Laurel and Hardy fame. And uh, uh, John Connolly has had a fascination with him uh, with Stan Laurel for, I guess, much of his life, and he finally decided to do the research and write a novel about him. Uh, so uh, it, there's, there's not a mystery in it, although maybe a mystery would be if we asked him why he, you know, st uh, had stepped outside the mystery form to write uh, this uh, fictional biography, but uh, it's, it's really cool. Great. Wonderful. That sounds very intriguing. <clears throat> well, I've just got a quick recommendation for those of you who like British procedural mysteries, police procedural mysteries. Check out the series by Stephen Booth, starting with his first book, Black Dog. Others in the series include Dancing with the Virgins, Blood on the Tongue, Blind to the Bones, and The Dead Place. Now, you don't need to start with the first one to enjoy the books, but I'd actually recommend it in this case, so you experience... The character development of the protagonist, a young detective named Ben Cooper, who's dealing with a family tragedy as the book opens. 
Author Stephen Booth was a newspaper journalist in the region for many years before he veered off into mystery fiction. His storytelling starts with a search for Laura, a missing teenage girl who disappears from her affluent home in the midst of England's Peak District. It's terrain Booth knows very well, and he has a masterful way of describing the rugged setting and the people, making them come alive for the reader. It's this sense of place, much like what David does with Victorian London, that really hooked me on this series. Detective Ben Cooper has an instinct about the missing girl, but begins to doubt his investigation results when he's forced to work with an intensely ambitious detective named Diane Fry, transferred from another division. I especially liked how the writer made High Summer in Derbyshire as ominous as deep, dark winter in a collapsed mining tunnel. His sense of atmosphere builds and tightens around the reader. The solution to this crime will come as a true surprise, and then you too will be hooked on a great series. In closing, our special thanks to master storyteller, mentor, teacher, and best-selling author David Morell for the interview today. An escape into the twisty dark alleys and elaborate overstuffed drawing rooms of Victorian London was just the thing I needed as a break from slogging through a first draft of a difficult book set during World War I. We're overjoyed and honored, David, that you could join us. Well, it was a lot of fun. I thank you for inviting me. Oh, we had such a good time. And in closing, keep reading and keep writing. <laughs>